Hey everybody, welcome back to another Tuesday's Tech Talk. This week we're going to be covering something that I've had a lot of questions about. You guys have been asking me about line sources and how line sources work, especially considering the episodes that we did previously on comb filtering. We looked at comb filtering effects of lining up a group of full range drivers and how the time delay differences within the, the arrays cause huge cancellations and knocks the top end right out of them. We looked at the use of multiple tweeters and the time differential between or time arrival effects from one tweeter versus the other can have the same effect. It can knock the whole upper frequency ranges right out of the response. Uh, we also looked at um, adding a super tweeter which has again the same effects. Whenever you have shallow slopes and you have a high crossover point where the wavelengths are really short then it just takes a little bit of differential in time from one to the other for one to completely cancel the other out cause huge holes in the response and things like that. So you guys kept saying what about line arrays? What about line arrays? Okay line arrays is a little bit different in how we handle it so we're gonna look, we're gonna look at that we're gonna look at the basics and we're gonna look at uh, some of my favorite speakers that are right here behind me which one is an actual array and the other is actually a line source. Um, the in extreme here to my right is what's considered an array. It's actually a point source speaker. Um, it has a lot of advantages that you'd get from a line source and it is seven feet tall. So people look at it as if it's a line source. It's not really a true line source. It's really, it's a true point source speaker. Um, but you have to consider the wavelengths and the crossover points and how they interact and what kind of waveform they project. Um, so like I said, you're getting some of the advantages of a line source because we're breaking down the frequency range in the lower regions into multiple drivers. So in this design we have a planar magnetic tweeter. It is offset back an inch and a half in time because that's the thickness of the baffle. It's mounted on the back of the baffle which puts it physically aligned with the voice coils of the six and a half inch mid-range drivers. And the tweeter being a waveguide, the waveguide increases the output in the lower frequency ranges and it allows for a much lower crossover point than if it were not within a waveguide. So in this case it's crossing about 1400 Hertz to the two mid-range drivers. They're playing down to or a crossover point of about 160 hertz or so, uh, all of it in, in an open baffle. Um, it's in what we call a wedge shape open baffle and on this type of design we do asymmetrical wings so we have a solid wing on one side and it's completely open on the other side, little short wings until you get to the lowest frequency range which is a full wedge shape. So uh, again these are crossing around 160 and there's eight six and a half inch drivers covering from 160 down to 40 something hertz depending on your rep. So like I said it has some of the advantages of line source when you look at the low frequency range that's being covered by eight drivers you have eight drivers sharing the load uh, so the response is really fast uh, when it's playing bass notes hitting those drums things like that big dynamic range you feel that impact and you think, wow, man, that thing is really hitting. You can just feel that bass. And you walk up and you look at the speaker and the woofers are just barely moving uh, because you have so many of them sharing the load. So the settling time is, is much faster because you don't have one woofer having to play uh, a high SPL level uh, with a heavy moving mass or anything like that. So not much stored energy there. Really fast settling time. So very much getting the advantage of a line source but with a narrow front baffle you're looking at a baffle that's only about eight inches wide before it starts radiusing uh, around to the side panels so imaging is fantastic transparency is fantastic speed you know across the board these speakers do a lot of really good things are they a true line source no a true line source would be like the speakers over here to my left this is the design we originally did for serenity acoustics it is a true line source, a true open baffle line source. 
And this we have our custom uh, Neo 3 drivers. We have uh, the BG original Neo 10 drivers. And we have a crossover point of about 1400 hertz or so between the tweeter and between the Neo 10s. Now, before I get really deep into the specifics of the speaker, let's back up and grab some basics so that we kind of understand near field, far field transitions and we can understand beaming frequency or beaming range of a driver. So what do I mean by that? Let's consider any driver, no matter how big a diameter it is, it's going to have a range where the output is going to beam if it is playing a frequency range where the wavelengths are shorter than the diameter of the diaphragm. So let's consider a 12 inch woofer. 12 inch woofer is the wavelength of the woofer itself or the wavelength of the, the distance that is the diameter of the driver, that's a mouthful, is about 1100 hertz. So anything above 1100 hertz in frequency range in a 12 inch woofer it's going to start to beam that uh, wavelength. In other words the off-axis response is more omni below that wavelength and as you go above that wavelength it really starts to beam. In other words the output is more in a straight line versus an omni pattern because those wavelengths that it's trying to reproduce are shorter than the width of the diaphragm. So when you move off axis you start losing output pretty quickly. Uh, that's why when you're crossing something to a 10 inch woofer about a 1k hertz crossover region is usually kind of a target of that's about as high as you want to run one of those woofers. Otherwise it'll have no output as you move off axis. If you go to a smaller driver to a 10 inch woofer, 10 inch woofer uh, the beaming frequency or beaming wavelength is going to be around 1300 hertz. Um, when you get smaller let's say an 8 inch woofer that frequency range is going to be about 1600 hertz. For a 6 inch driver it's about 2200 hertz. Uh, for a 4 inch driver it'd be about 3300 hertz. Uh, for a 2.5 inch tall driver or 2.5 inch diameter driver that beaming frequency would be about 5600 hertz. For a 1 inch diameter driver like a dome tweeter that's going to be about 1350. So consider that let's take a two and a half inch diameter driver anything above uh, 5600 hertz is going to be projected more in a beam versus anything that's below that the output is going to begin to spread out and become more omni. Now the reason that pertains to a line source is when, you, when we design a line source and you run a group of drivers like that up in a continuous line what you're effectively doing is you're making one driver that's really long. In this case, the line force is over here. Um, the height of it is nearly six feet tall, and the effective area of uh, the line source where um, you want to stay within the range, it's about five feet uh, through the middle of it. So anything within that range, uh, within that five foot range, the output is going to be pretty consistent. As soon as you start bring your ear or your microphone um, to the ends of the arrays the output in the upper frequency ranges is going to start to fall off and you're going to have an output that is very consistent within that range so long as you don't get above and below it. So there's advantages there also in that it minimizes ceiling and floor reflections in all those upper frequency ranges. So uh, you're just getting an output that is continuous within that distance. So, how does that work? And what are the distances uh, between the drivers? How important are those, let's say? Um, the distances between the drivers for this to work properly need to be within about one inch. If you keep it to within less than or within one inch, you can somewhat maintain the same response that you would get as if it were a continuously long driver. So let's say I have a, a tweeter and they, they made tweeters that were like the old RD series tweeters that were a continuous line. And when you measured that tweeter what you got was you were hearing the output of the upper frequency ranges as it dissipated right from or as it left the center of the driver. And what happened to the output 
at that same frequency at the top or, or at the bottom of the driver was it just went past you you really didn't hear it it really didn't spread out so you don't really hear that output so much you're only hearing it at that high frequency range when you're right in front of it same goes for uh, a continuous line of multiple drivers that are stacked that close apart it also matters that it's not a circular shape uh, to some degree when you have a, a tweeter that's a circle um, we consider the acoustic centers of those drivers in other words we look at the distance from the middle to the middle uh, that's how we look at the voice coil of that driver versus a planar magnetic or a ribbon the voice coil itself is the actual element so when you stack one on top of the other the voice coil the voice coil basically is going to be edge to edge so it helps improve things quite a bit when you're using that type of a driver in order to make a continuous line that way so what happens when we put a microphone out in front of the speaker and we're measuring the response and obviously we have a delay from the tweeters that are at the top versus the tweeters that we're in line with versus the tweeters that are at the bottom now let's take the upper frequency range let's take 10 k hertz and above remember i said the diaphragms are two and a half inches tall uh, on these so the beaming frequency is about 5600 hertz so everything above 5600 hertz is going to be projected in a straight line so in those frequency ranges um, as you move up with your microphone or with your ear you're basically just hearing the tweeter that you're in line with at that point so as you move up and down you're, you're kind of skipping from one to the next and you're staying within a range to where you, you have the blending of one to another and you're not hearing in the upper frequency ranges the tweeters that are at the top or the tweeters that are at the bottom you're not in line with them uh, you're outside of their beaming range so it's acting as if, the same as if it were a continuous driver so you're not getting that much cancellation effect in some uh, areas as frequency starts to decrease there are areas where there's a time differential from one set of drivers to the other and you would get a dip in the response but it's also filled in because some of the other drivers are closer to it and you're getting less of a dip in response so you're staying within the frequency range to where there's very little cancellation on some drivers and a lot of cancellation on the others what you get is a bit of an average when you take the frequency response so what you wind up with when you measure the line source is you you get an average that's consistent as you move the microphone up and down but you get little ripples in the response across the top end you see little ripples and where you may see a 2 dB peak and then a 2 dB dip typically that's about as much as you see um, as you move the microphone up or down the position of those peaks and dips may swap so where you had a little bit of a dip you may see a little bit of a peak and where you had a little bit of a peak you may see a little bit of a dip but it'll maintain an average response across that frequency range uh, that's very consistent now as frequency decreases the output of those drivers really start to spread out and they act as if they're one driver um, so you get a coupling effect uh, anytime you have a group of drivers to where you're, you're, you have one driver and you parallel it to another driver you, typically you gain 6 dB uh, like over here on this point source we have a 16 ohm driver another 16 ohm driver you put those two drivers in parallel and you pick up 6 dB uh, of output. Same with the low frequency drivers. We have 16 ohm drivers here. We have uh, 2 in series, 2 in series, 2 in series, 2 in series. You parallel those four groups, you're gaining, as you parallel the first group and the second group, you're gaining 6 dB of output. As you parallel it uh, one more time, you're doubling it again to the four below, you're gaining 6 dB of output. Now that is countered to some degree by the filter. The crossover is controlling how much output the whole thing has. The inductor that's in line with these drivers will pull the response down and I can use that to balance the output and the, um, the impedances which are matched in this case uh, so that it has a balanced frequency response. So with the tweeters that are all in line here in this particular model we have 
four tweeters in series, four tweeters in series, four tweeters in series, four tweeters in series, and then those four groups are all parallel back. So we have 16 drivers in series parallel uh, um, configuration. So the impedance goes right back to the same that it would be with a single driver. What happens to the output? Did we gain 6 dB and gain 6 dB? Uh, no and yes. It depends on frequency. Again, with the microphone dead center in the array, in the upper frequency range, you're only going to be getting the output of a single driver. doesn't matter how many groups you parallel on a line source, you're still just going to have, especially at 20 kHz, you're still only going to be in line with one driver. You'll never have any more output than you will with one driver. And from there to about 10 kHz, you're going to get uh, a slight bit of gain, but not, not a lot, because like I said, you're still only within one driver. And then as frequency decreases, you get more and more output. So you're going to gain that 12 dB of output at the lowest frequency range that the tweeters cover. That's another reason why when you design a line source, textbook slopes on the filters don't apply. For you guys that think, I'm just going to get a line of tweeters, I'm going to get a line of mid-bass drivers, I'm going to buy an electronic crossover, and I'll just use it by ear and I'll adjust it to where the response is, is correct between the two. No, no, it doesn't work that way. Um, those are textbook filters that are on those electronic crossovers. They don't apply to a line source because you don't have a textbook slope. You have a slope that you have no gain at the top end and as frequency decreases you have a lot of gain in the bottom end. So the filter has to become active at the higher frequency range and basically take that frequency response and fold it over. You're, you're basically using a smaller capacitor at the front of the network. You're folding that response over to make a flat response and then you're using the rest of the elements of your filter to control the very bottom end and can control the crossover point. So it's very unconventional in the way we design a filter for a line source uh, versus a typical speaker. So uh, that's what we have to do in order to get a accurate frequency response. So a little different uh, than you get from a lot of other a lot of other types of speakers. Now um, advantages in the line source very much like the array uh, when you're sharing the load against uh, or amongst a lot of drivers you get a lot of speed a lot of uh, detail, uh, very little stored energy. In this case, the drivers are all planar magnetic, so they're all about the fastest driver you can you can come up with to begin with. So you got lots of speed, lots of quickness, and then you're sharing the load amongst the whole thing. Uh, the, the, it's incredible. It's it's I can't even describe it how different it is versus conventional speakers, and when it's playing. You can literally walk right up to it and stick your ear to it and you think, wow, that's barely even on and you can go up and down the array with your ear to it realizing that each segment is not playing very loud at all. And as you get further and further away from it, you are hearing more and more of the whole array. So it's, um, it's kind of eerie how it works. It's When people first walk up to it, put their ear to it and back away. It's usually a bit of a surprise um, how much uh, each of the drivers are just sharing the load. It, they're not playing very loud independently, but as a group um, playing uh, pretty high SPL levels. Um, it's interesting how, again, they don't load the room like a typical speaker. Um, you have minimal floor to ceiling interactions and uh, it's just, it's different. It's one of those things you have to experience. In some ways, it's a level of performance that you can't get from a regular speaker. Uh, but it has to be designed properly. Uh, I mentioned earlier there's some do's and don'ts. Uh, some of the don'ts. Uh, if you look at some of the earlier line sources uh, from uh, Infinity and Genesis, you'd see a continuous ribbon, and you'd and that continuous ribbon had a top end above 10 kHz that just fell right off. So they took little circular planar magnetic tweeters and just lined them up down the side to try and bring back that top octave. The problem is the acoustic centers were so far apart um, that you got a huge cancellation effect from one to the other, much like you would with the um, full range drivers. You know, because you only have a one inch diaphragm, even up to 1350 Hz, 
where to be is beaming frequency, um, it's it's spreading out in all directions. So you you're not just hearing just one driver as you move from one to the other so much. You're you're catching quite a few of them all at once, and there's a time differential between them, and you get huge cancellation effects. So lining up uh, a group of tweeters that are a dome tweeter, spacing them that far apart, it doesn't work at all. And in the case of those speakers, they were crossing a really high crossover point, which was up at you know 10 kHz. So as you move left or right, the delay between the tweeter and the continuous tweeter, or the group tweeters versus the continuous tweeter, as you move left or right, you could very easily create a one inch differential in time delay without even moving very far off axis. So one would be delayed in time versus the other in such a way that there would be a cancellation effect just immediately. Uh, especially as you start moving very far off axis left or right, you'd get huge cancellation effects from one to the other. In this case, with these line sources, the crossover point is down around 1400, 1500 hertz. So you're looking at a wavelength that's so long that even if you move left or right, you're not far enough off axis to cause a very, very much phase rotation. You're only looking at about a 10 or 15 degree phase rotation as you start to move off axis, you know, 15, 20 degrees off axis. So the response doesn't change that much. The wavelengths are much longer. This is a, a good way to do it. And if you look at even a lot of the line sources out there where the crossover point begin, begins coming up to two and a half, uh, three K hertz even, uh, your wavelengths are starting to get short. You know, you're looking at wavelengths that are six inches or less. So as soon as you start moving off axis, you've got a delay in time of one set of drivers versus the other set of drivers and you start getting cancellation effects. So one of the big advantages of something like this, really low crossover points, really long wavelengths, that means the off-axis response is consistent in every direction. So that's one of the do's versus the, the don'ts. Like I said, there are a lot of line sources out there that aren't good examples of how a line source works and there are line sources out there that are pretty incredible. Um, I would love for you guys, everyone out there, to get to hear something like these that are a full array or a full line source that are cost no object performance levels. They're not cost no object performance levels when you when you look at cost. Um, these, this is something we sell as a kit. Uh, this is something we may offer uh, as a kit. We're going to do some probably fully assembled and get those into production soon. Uh, right now this is the second one that we've done. Um, another issue with doing something like this is what you build it out of. The original models were made out of aluminum. So the whole thing was CNC milled out of aluminum. Um, you couldn't really do it out of MDF. When you cut all the holes for the drivers, you have nothing left but a frame. So if you took the front baffle and you lifted it up on one side, there, there's not enough support there. It just almost snap in half. So it's, it's very difficult to do something like this. Uh, this particular one is done in a composite material that's super strong. Um, so it's, it's still really expensive to CNC mill um, this whole thing out of a composite material. Uh, but it works. It works really well. And uh, it's, it's something that we're going to be putting into production. I hope you guys get to uh, hear it. I know you got a little bit of a, a plug there for some of our products, but it's hard to use our products as an example and not give you a little something about it. Um, that's about it for today as far as line sources. If you guys have additional questions about line sources, throw them out there to me. Uh, put them in the comments section. I'll try to cover it. And that's all for this week. Thanks for dropping in and uh, see you next week.